This is CBC Here and Now. Another two-way race in Fortune Bay, Cape Lahoon, Tracy Perry's old district. PC candidate Charlene Walsh hoping to keep the district blue. Liberal candidate Elvis Loveless looking to turn it red. I'll profile both candidates. That's ahead on Here and Now. Arrested development. A property owner in St. John says the city is shooting itself in the foot. I'm trying to spend millions and millions of dollars and all I'm having is a fight with the city. I'll have more coming up on Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain in our newsroom. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. And we start tonight with politics. With the election just over a week away, a new poll is giving the progressive conservatives the edge among decided voters, but also suggests most people think the liberals will win on May 16th. The poll of 700 eligible voters was conducted by Abacus Data. It shows support among decided voters for the PC party at 42%. Support for the liberals trails behind at 37%, and support for the NDP sits at 15%. Support for other, which would include independents and the NL Alliance, is at 6%. Now, according to Abacus data, the PCs are doing well on the Avalon Peninsula, eastern and central parts of the island, while the Liberals are stronger on the west coast and in Labrador. Now, despite the fact the Liberals are trailing the PCs in the poll, a majority of respondents, 53%, said they expect the Liberals to win the election. The margin of error for the study is plus or minus 3.8 percentage points, 19 times out of 20. Now, that poll is a stark contrast to yesterday's poll by MQO Research, which puts the Liberals in first place for party support. But Abacus Data says that could be due to the timing of the poll. The MQO poll was conducted before the televised debate, while the Abacus poll was done immediately following last week's leaders' debate. And as you can imagine, with any poll, there is a lot of information to digest. We'll do that in about 20 minutes when the head of the polling company joins us live from Toronto. Now, the district seat in Fortune Bay, Cape Lahoon, is wide open. Two-term MHA Tracy Perry is not seeking re-election, and a two-way race is shaping up in the South Coast District. There's no NDP or NL Alliance candidate, leaving Liberals and the PCs to fight it out. Here now is Katie Breen reports. When political candidates go door knocking, they typically knock, but not here in Seal Cove at this house. Anybody home? Hello. Hello. Liberal candidate Elvis Loveless knows he has the support of these two, his mom and dad. He was a good boy growing up. I'm not, I'm not saying it because I'm not a camera or nothing like that, but he was. He was a good boy growing up. Loveless first ran in his home district in 2007. He lost, and it's been Tory territory since. He's hoping this time around he can flip the area red. He started working as the premier's assistant a couple of years ago, and he says he's familiar with the local files. Healthcare is probably the most, uh, the biggest issue I've been hearing at the door. And maintaining what we already have uh, is very important, and, and working on solutions for primary deliver, d delivery of primary health care in the, in, the, in the area. Fortune Bay Cape Lahoon relies on the water. The lobster fishery and aquaculture are the biggest industries. The PC candidate Charlene Walsh hopes the area and the province can become more food secure and get back to the land. This is some of the plants that we have. Uh, Pools Cove is one of the communities on the south coast taking part in the Food First NL pilot project aimed at getting more communities growing their own food. And it's working. About 80 of the 180 people in the community are on board. And Walsh says this is the kind of project that fits with her vision for the district. I certainly like to see a lot more food sustainability as you know, and uh, the aquaculture is really big. I would like to see more employment. We have to do something with the roads. I mean, they're absolutely deplorable, so we do have to have eyeballs on that as well. Walsh, a realtor, is originally from St. Albans and has the support of the area's former MHA Tracy Perry. While her opponent has been more involved in politics, Walsh says if elected, Perry will get her up to speed. Certainly he does have more government uh, background, if you will. But I don't necessarily think that's a positive because I really don't have any 
nobody's actually told me what I can't do. So I'm looking at it from a really fresh perspective. Katie Breen, CBC News, Pools Cove. Well, it was the closest race of 2015 and it's shaping up to be one to watch this election night. The district of Terra Nova is a true bellwether in this province and this time around both the Liberals and the Tories see a path to victory. Here now is Garrett Berry with that story. Meet the challenger. Two years on Clarenville's town council, 21 with the Canadian forces. I've faced a lot of adversity and I think that a lot of people who get in politics uh, haven't faced that same sort of adversity and they get in, and they change once they get in. Uh, anybody who knows me knows that I've uh, done all my changing. His job? Try to take back the district that was oh so close in 2015. And there's only I think 50 votes maybe that separated the, the major two parties, is that 54. correct? 50, 54. I, I think that's a number you are awfully familiar with, eh? Absolutely. No question, every vote counts and the Liberal he says his four years in office give him the name recognition he needs. And I can appreciate people didn't know me then, but I can assure you people know me today. Uh, my name is very common in all the communities in this district. And let's not forget the issues. I know that road infrastructure is a big issue. Uh, we've, uh, we've done a lot in the past three and a half years. Every community in this district should be a destination, and it's not. It's been overlooked for a long time, and I hope that I can change that. This time around, the NDP is not running a candidate. A sign of the times with... And the NL Alliance believes they stand to gain. Well, we're, we're uh, you know, kind of not playing the same or, or playing a game at all, really, that uh, the other parties are playing, that we're basically talking about structural change. It wasn't that long ago that Holloway was alleging bullying inside the House of Assembly and a minister of his own government suggested he should consider leaving the Liberal Party. Well, Liberal leader Dwight Ball stopped with Holloway in Clarenville last week, and the pair say that's just water under the bridge. He's our MHA here, and he's our, he's our, uh, he's our candidate in this district, and he deserves to be the candidate here in this district. You've heard from people here in this room today, and, and people, he's got a lot of support in this community, and I know that. As goes Terra Nova, so goes the province. In each of the last seven elections, the party that's won here has formed government, making this riding one to watch. Garrett Berry, CBC News, Clarenville. And the new Democratic Party wants to maintain the years-long tuition freeze at Memorial University while progressively reducing other tuition fees. Leader Allison Coffin revealed the NDP's plan in an election announcement at a bookstore in St. John's today. Coffin says cuts to post-secondary education will hurt the institutions themselves as well as their students. And she says that government should be maintaining the funding, not cutting it. Students are far too often straddled with high student debt and forced to move away to find a job. At a time when our province is facing high youth outmigration, we need to leverage our post-secondary institutions as a means to encourage students to get more education and stay here for the long term. We commit to reinstating the full needs-based grants to ensure students live and thrive in this province. And Coffin was asked today about a comment she made earlier the week. She suggested people spoil their ballots if they live in a district where there is no NDP candidate. Well, today she took a softer approach, saying the comment was aimed at people who are frustrated that the Liberals called the election months before the scheduled date. Also encouraging uh, them to protest their vote in a variety of ways, like writing uh, Dwight Ball and letting them know how displeased they are with the corruption of the democratic process as well. So, so are you advocating people spoil their ballots? I am advocating that people speak their minds and tell the, uh, uh, the current government that they are displeased with the democratic process and they can do that in any way they want. This is a democratic society. Um, does that include spoiling your ballots? It is whatever they choose to do. And while Election Day is still about a week away, early birds can cast their ballots tomorrow in the advance polls. Advance polls are open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and that's not the only option if you want to vote ahead of time. Any eligible voter can vote by special ballot, but you'll need to act fast. The deadline for that is tomorrow at 6 p.m. Anyone wanting to vote by special ballot or in tomorrow's advance polls can find a list of locations on the Elections NL website.
Well, temperatures much cooler, especially along the west coast today. Here were your temperatures. Your afternoon high only reaching 5 degrees in Corner Brook, 6 in Deer Lake, and then similar temperatures as we head towards the Avalon. Now the northeast coast, much cooler between 2 and 3 degrees. And then Labrador as well, also pretty chilly. Uh, Lab City sitting at 1 degree this afternoon. So we do have uh, more cloud cover in play right across the province. Uh, we can see that low spinning just off the coast of Newfoundland tonight, and it's going to uh, continue to spread a little bit further north as we head through the night tonight. So there's that low there. Ridge of high pressure in behind it. Then our next weather maker is uh, sitting over the states right now. Now I mentioned snow in the forecast yesterday. Uh, this system is going to bring some accumulating snow as we head towards the weekend. I know it's not exactly what you want to hear, uh, but that does look like what's going to happen. So overnight tonight, we are looking at that risk of flurries and light snow for mainly the Avalon heading towards eastern Newfoundland after midnight. But I'll have all those details coming up. In national news, a stunning end today to one of the most politically charged criminal cases in recent Canadian history. Federal prosecutors stayed the breach of trust charge against Vice Admiral Mark Norman, the former second in command of the Canadian military. Now, this decision comes two years after he was first accused of leaking secret information about the Canadian Navy and a shipbuilding contract. Well, this afternoon, Norman said he was relieved to be exonerated, but he also pointed the finger at the Liberal government for taking so long. The alarming and protracted bias of perceived guilt across the senior levels of government has been quite damaging. I have an important story to tell that Canadians will want and need to hear. It is my intention in the coming days to tell that story. Well, the case was dropped after Norman's defense lawyer submitted new information about the case. Crown prosecutors say that after they saw it, they concluded that they no longer had a reasonable chance for conviction. Norman says that uh, she wants to go back to work, or he rather, wants to go back to work as soon as possible. In local news, Philip Pinn is back in custody this after he was released following a stint in a federal prison. A condition of Pinn's release was that he not consume drugs or alcohol or associated with criminally active people. Back in 2015, Pinn was sentenced to eight and a half years in prison for the shooting death of his best friend. That was Nick Windsor. He was released in January, even though he was deemed a high risk to offend. Police say Pinn was involved in a fight at a hotel back in February. It was possibly related to illegal activity, and a drug test found that he had used marijuana as well as morphine. St. John's now, where a property owner is accusing the city of stifling downtown development. He says the unacceptably long wait for city permits and lack of cooperation is going to ultimately hurt St. John's as well as its residents. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. This is insane. A major setback for Vic Lawler at the old Fortis building on Water Street. And we've been dealing with the city on and off and this process has been going on and on and on and it just seems like it doesn't want to end. The Fortis building is one of nine structures that Lawler owns downtown. He says his development plans have been plagued with delays caused by city officials. The problem is, is people at the city don't like me and they don't like that I'm not a yes person and I don't conform sometimes to some of the things that they want and, uh, and they're basically going to slow the process for me. And in doing so, they're hurting the community. Lawler says all he wants to do is keep businesses downtown and bring new ones to the area. He warns that if he can't, the city's tax base may shrink. It's going to affect the business tax base. So you know what? What you're going to see is you're going to see your residential tax go up or you're going to see another uh, vacancy tax be applied because you know the city won't be able to pay their bills. But it, they can if they let people come and develop. Now, city officials declined CBC's request for an interview, but they said they had two things to say to Lawler. First, the stop work order at the Fortis building was put in place because work was being done there without a permit. And secondly, they said the city officials are just following the rules to ensure that all residents in St. John's are safe. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Across the pond now where Prince Harry and Meghan introduced their newborn son to the world today. And the newest royal, well, he slept through his big debut. He has the sweetest temperament. He's really calm and... Um... Uh, he gets that problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he's been, he's just been the dream, so 
It's been a special couple days. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex told a very small group of journalists that becoming parents has been amazing. And after introducing the baby to his great grandmother, the Queen, they announced that his name uh, on Instagram will be Archie Harrison Mountbatten Windsor. He does not have an official royal title, but he could be given one later in life. Well, at the Muskrat Falls inquiry today, testimony from senior staff from Astaldi, the company that was responsible for the biggest contract at the Muskrat Falls project. We'll hear what they had to say. That's in about 10 minutes. This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. Order your tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. Well, temperatures, uh, as I mentioned earlier today, much cooler than we saw yesterday, and they've dropped even more so uh, over the last couple of hours. So sitting around two degrees for most of the Avalon and along the northeast coast, dipping to zero in Twillingate, and then we've got those cooler temperatures again up through Labrador. Happy Valley Goose Bay, though, was the warm spot for Labrador. We saw plenty of sunshine there, and if we take a look at the current satellite radar, you can see that cloud cover starting to make its way towards uh, central Newfoundland. Otherwise, 
or rather central Labrador. Weather, uh, weather wise we've got that low spinning off of the coast of Newfoundland and that's bringing some showers, some drizzle and uh, some fog right along with it. So it's starting to make its way towards northern portions of the Avalon and will continue to do so as we head through the night tonight after midnight that looks like it'll change over to the uh, chance of wet snow as those temperatures are going to be hovering around the zero degree mark. Uh, even towards Clarenville, Bonavista, all could see that potential for some wet flurries. And then I wouldn't rule it out either uh, for areas along uh, the Bayvert Peninsula and then up through St. Anthony. That should stay as rain, but that chance of flurries. Uh, one degree tonight, two degrees in Cornerbrook with that potential for some rain drizzle and fog. And then same for Port of Asque, Marystown sitting around three degrees tonight. Now up through Labrador, uh, temperatures hovering around the zero degree mark, still looking at that risk of uh, either showers or flurries through the overnight along the coast. That's where it'll likely be a rain snow mix tonight, hovering around one degree. Same for the Straits. Those winds uh, generally out of the northeast between 15 and 20 kilometers per hour. So looking ahead to tomorrow, those temperatures are going to climb. So anything uh, that does fall tomorrow afternoon, staying unsettled for most of the island should change over to showers. Again, drizzle, fog possible, at least through the first half of the day. Best chance of seeing that sun will be down through the south coast and then up through Labrador, staying unsettled again. Eventually, though, we're going to see some clearing and we can thank a big ridge of high pressure for that. And you can see those skies clear right across the board up through Labrador. So here's your temperatures tomorrow. Again, that uh, snow tonight, two, maybe three centimeters of wet slushy snow shouldn't accumulate too much, either maybe on the grassy surfaces, but that's about it. Uh, sitting between four degrees along the coast to a little bit warmer towards the southern half. So Marystown sitting around nine degrees with that potential to see some sunshine tomorrow. Otherwise, that snow will change over to showers tomorrow. Four degrees for St. John. So heading towards Grand Falls, Windsor, we're going to see that similar mix again with those temperatures inland, a couple of degrees warmer. Twilling Gate only seeing a, a high near two degrees. Harbor Breton showers in the morning and then clearing that sun should peak out, should reach a high near nine degrees. And we could reach those double digits. It looks like for Stephenville, 12 degrees, 10 in Burgio. And then as we head a little bit further north along the coast, Corner Brook, uh, still going to see that potential for some showers tomorrow. Same for the northern peninsula and then the coastal portion of Labrador looking at either rain or snow. Three degrees at least through the first half of the day. Then I mentioned high pressure which should clear things out. So plenty of sunshine but still staying cool for Lab City. Churchill Falls five degrees and then Happy Valley Goose Bay similar temperature there. Now I mentioned the snow in the uh, extended forecast. I'll have all those details coming up. A poll from Abacus Data says Chess Crosby and the Conservatives have a five-point lead over Dwight Ball and the Liberals. This just 24 hours after we told you about an MQO poll that had the Liberals way out in front. So why the difference? Well, David Coletto is the CEO of Abacus Data and he joins us from our studio in Toronto. Good evening. Good evening, Anthony. Quite a difference in these two polls. Why should we believe yours? <laughs> well, I mean, I, MQO is a very good company and uh, you know I respect the, the research that they did. I think what's different between our poll are, are two factors, the main one being the timing. We completed uh, the entirety of this survey um, after the leaders debate. We went in the field on, on Thursday and we finished uh, Sunday evening. And so it's a much uh, more recent snapshot of public opinion. And not to say whether the debate really moved the numbers or not, but I, I think given what we saw even in the MQ, MQO right. poll with almost 40% of um, respondents to that survey saying they were undecided. Something may have happened over those days that that made the, the result perhaps look different. Okay, that's the only well, estimate. That's that's my only hypothesis at this stage. But I think it's a it's a big factor in the uh, a more s closer. Um, snapshot uh, gives us, I think, a little more accurate view of where people okay. are today. So, so you've discovered, or your your poll finds, the PCs have a five percentage point higher uh, percentage in voter support. What's the significance of that in your estimation? Well, it, the, the the survey has a plus or minus of about four percent. So, um, it, the way that you look at it that way is, it's likely that Chess Crosby and the PCs are leading, um, but it could be as big a lead as as upwards of nine points. But it could also be that it's only a one point lead. So this, you know, you got to you have to realize that a survey has some error built into it. Mm -hmm. And but to recognize it's most likely a very close race right now. And there's right. still a lot of voters, 20% in our survey, who said they were still undecided. 
Now, underneath the horse race numbers, you also found that there seems to be an appetite for change. Explain that to me. Well, we asked this question, you know, which statement comes closest to your view? Do you definitely want a change in government? Would you like change, but it's not important? Or do you want to see the Liberals reelected? And what we found was two thirds of respondents said they would like to see change in government with about half of people saying they definitely want a change. So there, there appears to be a desire for change. It's not as high as we've seen in other provinces that have had recent elections, but there's still a sustained sense of, of, of change among PC voters, no surprise. Mm -hmm. Most want, definitely want to change. Even among New Democrat supporters, there's a desire for change. So I think this, the, the reason this is so competitive is there seems to be a growing appetite for change. People aren't you know, enamored with Chess Crosby. They don't love him. They don't see him as uh, perhaps uh, the most likable or, or, or up to the job. But when they, when they look at Mr. Ball versus Mr. Crosby, more people are right now siding with the PCs. Okay, uh, last question for you, because I think this is like the dichotomy in your poll, is that for everything you've just said, more people think the Liberals are still going to win despite everything you've said. So how do you explain that? Well, I mean, the first point is, you know, the MQO poll came out yesterday. It was the only survey that we've seen publicly uh, looking at this election. Ours is the second. So up until now, most people really had no sense of what their neighbours were thinking beyond maybe their, their own neighbourhood or, or those that they talked to. We've seen this in the past. Uh, where, where people expect one thing even though they're telling us they're planning to do another. And I think one of the most important things to consider as we analyze these numbers is we still have a week to go. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people um, who are not only undecided, I think are still thinking about their choices and perhaps the expectation that right. the Liberals were going to win. And now perhaps that's in doubt might make people reconsider, particularly those New Democrat supporters who in many districts across the province won't actually have a new Democrat to vote for. You heard Alison Coffin on your show saying, um, you know, either spoil your ballot or write a letter to the Premier. That's a big variable that we're not quite okay. sure okay. Uh, we'll, how we'll land uh, next week. Mr. Coletto, uh, appreciate your time. Thanks for getting in our Toronto studio. Appreciate that. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, now to the Muskrat Falls inquiry. Today, the inquiry heard from Astaldi, the company that landed the biggest contract for the project. One of three people to testify says there were problems reaching targets right from the start. Sees hair reports. Mauro Palumbo, a manager in Astaldi Canada's legal and contracts department, testified the company wanted to have a deal in place for the powerhouse spillway and dams by June of 2013 in order to get things moving before the harsh winter kicked in. That didn't happen. Instead, the deal was signed in late November, the start of winter. And days before it was signed, an experienced Astaldi project leader warned his company not to sign a deal with Nalcor because the delay made it impossible to reach established construction dates. Palumbo says that advice wasn't followed because there was a lot of money on the table and they felt their relationship with Nalcor was solid. That some principle of cooperation, good faith, uh, 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 goodwill in order to achieve the target was feasible with this client. Okay. But Nelcor inquiry lawyer Dan Simmons asked why Astaldi would sign a deal committing itself to construction targets knowing they couldn't reach them. At that point Astaldi had not told anyone at Nelcor that they did not believe that they could meet those dates. I don't know. I has a I told you before I had not direct contact with uh, Nalcor, therefore I cannot uh, give you an answer. Even as that contract was signed, there were other signs that the solid relationship wasn't as cozy uh, as it uh, appeared. Inquiry uh, counsel yeah. Barry Learmouth pointed to the time when a top Astaldi official landed in St. John's and someone met him at the airport with flowers. The honeymoon didn't last very long, did it? These flowers? No. Uh, these flowers had uh, short lives. Yeah. The inquiry will resume Thursday. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. What will it take to turn the fishery right side up in this province? Well, maybe to start with, we could start talking about it. That has not happened much in this election campaign. We'll meet a woman who's concerned about that next.
Welcome back to Here and Now. One issue that uh, my next guest says hasn't been discussed enough in this election campaign is the fishery. Kimberly Oren joins me here. I should say I joined Kimberly here in uh, Petty Harbour. So Kimberly, uh, what are you concerned about? That there's been no discourse uh, about the fishery or fishing in uh, the election talk so far. And so I'm wondering, where is it? Now, your organization uh, is concerned about this. Tell me a bit about that. Right. Fishing for Success is a nonprofit social enterprise, and uh, we aim to teach young people about their fishing heritage, to find space for women and newcomers. And we do all this by um, the social enterprise component is uh, providing tourism experiences and using that revenue to fund our community programming because we believe in the fishery. All right. Now, as you know, politicians, when it comes to voting time, they tend to care more about the economy. A lot of attention to oil and muskrat falls. Fishery is still worth a lot of money to this province. Are you surprised that it seems absent? Absolutely, because the fishery, as you just said, is worth a lot to this province. But there's also a lot of cross-links and spin-offs from it, too. For example, tourism. And if you think about culture and heritage, all you have to do is walk the rooms and see all of the... Um, you know, beautiful artwork that's there that's based on ocean going and um, fishery related activities. So right. what inspires us? Yeah, or the music on George Street per se. The music, absolutely. Our musicians are inspired by the sea and fishing and uh, probably your nan's hooked rug might have a fishing thing depicted on it too. Right, but usually politicians are attracted to money and jobs when it comes to this kind mm. of thing. So you're not just talking about the jobs right on fishing boats, are you? No, it's, as I said, all of this cross-linked um, activities that spill out into communities based on um, the sustainability and viability of small-scale fisheries because they, they sell their fish and they bring that money home to their communities and they buy their gear and their groceries and their fuel and they raise their families. And uh, again, all of those other cross-links that are very important to our economy also. When it comes back to the dollars and cents, though, uh, the future of the fishery, I mean, a lot of the politicians talk about diversifying the economy, looking at, towards new ways for Newfoundlanders to make livings. What, what is the state of the fishery right now? Well, the state of the fishery is pretty discouraging as far as uh, young people getting involved. The average age of the new fish harvester is 37, which uh, is not speaking well to fishing for the future. And so most of our fishermen, well, not most of them, but say 30, about 30% 30 of them are over 54. So what are we doing to guarantee that we have people to fish for the future? Because I know you've been talking about the economy so much, but fish is food. The government also wants to double our food security from 10% to 20% by 2022. So how does wild fisheries um, you know, tally into that? And so what are we doing to engage our young people? Um, right now, we're, we're not doing so much. You know, um, Young people decide what they want to be when they grow up when they're about nine. Uh, the farmers have uh, been working on that. So they've got things like little green thumbs and agriculture in the classrooms and the province celebrates um, agricultural literacy week. But we're, we're not doing anything for fishing. So just over a week to go before we all head to the polls. As a final question, Kimberly, what advice would you have for politicians as we head into the final stretch of election 2019? Well, I want to hear more about uh, what what they're going to do as far as their policies for small-scale fisheries and improving the sustainability and viability of them for the future because they have small-scale fisheries are still the best uh, resource that our rural communities have uh, for their resiliency and their sustainability and heritage preservation and poverty eradication and food security and there's just so many connections to fishing that we all really need to start talking about it, especially with climate change and ocean issues on the way too. This is something that we all should be involved in. All right, Kimberly, thanks for coming on here and now. I look forward to seeing the, the reaction to what you had to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now about that reaction to get fisheries on the campaign agenda, Fishing for Success has sent the parties five questions and they range from employment to food security as well as sustainability. And they've asked the politicians to send them back their answers by this Friday. A proposal to build an industrial composting operation in Chapel Arm isn't getting a warm welcome from its neighbors. It's the third time Newfoundland Industrial Composting has tried to get the green light from government, but like Holyrood and Whitburn, Chapel Arm is hoping to shut them down. The community held an information session last night and our Jeremy Eaton was there. Currently, there is a formal environmental assessment registration in place for the Long Harbor Access Road Industrial Composting Facility. And we want them to know what action that they can take because there is something that they can do. We're going to encourage them to sign petitions. We're going to encourage them to write um, to the comments section of the proposal 
and we will give them the email address for that. To receive and compost mink farm offal, carcasses, spent hens and dead birds, sheep, cattle, hogs, and fish processing wastes at later stages of operations. That is taken directly out of the proposal. Well, I have concerns for the people. I have concerns for the environment. And um, I have concerns that the minister would consider even reviewing a proposal like this within five kilometers of any human receptors. Officially, uh, you know, we've been apparently uh, supposed to be, as an agriculture industry, providing all the material uh, to keep this project going. But no commodity in agriculture uh, within the Federation has been, uh, has been contacted. There's been no discussion about, uh, about any of this. That's not to say that it uh, can't be feasible, um, you know, from top to bottom, but uh, there's so many unknowns in the mix of all this that I, I can't possibly see how, it, uh, how, how we can give it a, a stamp at this point. You know, I'm not opposed to composting and I'm not opposed to job creation but certainly it needs to be responsible, uh, responsible to the environment and responsible economically. And this is not either of those. How to keep thieves out of your car. Coming up, you'll get the lowdown from CBC Investigates. Welcome back to our newsroom. Three Toronto landlords are speaking out about what they're calling a nightmare tenant, and it involves a woman who used to live and run a controversial business here in St. John's. Now, these landlords all have similar stories about Isrit Khan. They say she moves into apartments and then she stops paying the rent, makes false calls to emergency services, and then refuses to move out. The CBC's Farah Morali has their story. Almost two months since his basement tenant moved out, and Abdul Mohar is still cleaning up. You can see this is a rotten meat, it's very smelly. I throw it up, but still you can see there's a blood and everything, and I try to clean it up. But leftover food and trash were the least of Mohar's landlord problems. One day, uh, like around 1.30 on Sunday night, uh, cops came up and my door, oh, they have laundry in the 
uh, uh, the machine can you open the door so that's what's going on she called almost every day cops for no reason sometimes or he stole my laundry sometimes he stole my detergent mohar says for nearly seven months those visits from police were weekly sometimes daily occurrence he says his tenant israt khan repeatedly harassed him and his family she's uh, uh, claiming falsely that i assault her I'm taking her pictures when she was sleeping naked and I'm taking picture from the window. On top of it all, Mohar says Khan stopped paying rent, then refused to leave. I even didn't know that people like her exist in this world. Mohar did some digging and found out he wasn't alone. He recently met Avtar Singh Chima, who says he went through a similar ordeal with Khan. False calls to police and she even accused him and his two sons of sexually harassing her. CBC News spoke to a third landlord who described a similar experience renting to Khan. It's not the first time Israt Khan has made headlines. CBC News first reported on her in 2015 when she was accused of harassing employees at her St. John's Newfoundland thrift store and not paying them properly. One month later, Service Newfoundland, a provincial body, issued a warning about Khan after she illegally took out an ad in the newspaper for an unregistered investment company called Bambiland Inc. CBC Toronto repeatedly tried to reach Khan for comment through texts, emails, and calls. The number you are calling is unavailable. Please try again later. She never returned our calls. It was really frustrating um, because uh, the to landlord and tenant board process is quite lengthy. It can take six months uh, or longer uh, you know, to get through the process. Advocates for landlords blame a lack of resources at the landlord and tenants board and loopholes that allow some to game the system. We have heard examples of tenants not paying rent for a year or longer. And so I think those are the things that need to perhaps be looked at to say, is there not a better way we can do this? Mohar has this advice for others. I would tell every single landlord to check their backgrounds, uh, check uh, with the previous landlords, which I didn't do that. Uh, if I have done that, I'm not in this situation right now. He says his first foray into being a landlord will likely be his last. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. Well, the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary has some advice about how to deter thieves from breaking into your car and stealing your belongings. That's tonight's topic on The Lowdown, our CBC Investigate series on consumer news you can use from reporter Jen White. When you park your car, the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary says there are things to keep in mind to help keep thieves out. Here's the lowdown on how to prevent thefts from your vehicle. It's best to park in a well-lit area. Ensure the outside of your home is well-lit. Offenders prefer to work in the shadows. When parking your vehicle, whether it's in a parking lot or in your driveway, you want to make sure your windows are up, your doors are locked, and your keys in a secure location. The RNC says criminals will not hesitate to enter or break into your vehicle if they see something they want or spot something of value. Ensure you keep valuables out of plain sight within your vehicle. Keep valuables in a safe place such as your trunk or remove them from your vehicle. Offenders take an opportunity when they see one. The police say it's also important to be vigilant. As the weather warms up, we will see more foot traffic in our neighborhoods. If you see someone that seems out of place or an unusual vehicle in your neighborhood, or any suspicious activity, contact the RNC and we will follow up. Well, Governor General Julie Payette welcomed 39 recipients into the Order of Canada today. No, excellence does not happen randomly. It is the product of absolute deliberate intent, sustained effort throughout all the time unwavering and absolute perfect execution and rigorous execution. Inductees are re recognized for their exceptional service and contributions to Canada. Among some of those awarded are a scientist, a vascular surgeon, and the first woman to ever serve as the Chief Justice of Canada. The Order of Canada is one of the country's highest civilian honors. So boys, the provincial election is coming up soon, and a lot of us are looking for some good changes and improvements. So how do you make those changes and improvements? Well, our election commentator Vicki Mullally has the answer next.
Well, I mentioned that potential for some snow tonight uh, for parts of the Avalon and then eastern Newfoundland here. And just do a quick recap of the forecast for tomorrow. Temperatures are still going to be sitting in the single digits, but that snow will change over to rain. Best chance of seeing that uh, sunshine will be along the south coast, potentially even reaching the double digits. And then we've got unsettled conditions for the first half of the day, at least along coastal Labrador, and then things should clear out. Sunshine moves in and so does high pressure. So uh, taking a look a little bit ahead to uh, Thursday and Friday, the next system is on the doorstep. So we're going to see that cloud cover push in likely through the evening and overnight hours. Uh, but before that, we're going to see it looks like plenty of sunshine and then that system will move in this one does look like it's got a little bit more punch to it and uh, towards the evening hours we could see things change over to snow. So here's a look at those temperatures as I mentioned sunshine uh, reaching those double digits more than likely uh, 14 15 degrees for parts of the west and south coast again along the northeast coast though as we still continue to be in that flow we're going to see some cooler temperatures only in the single digits. Happy Valley Goose Bay should reach double digits as well thanks to plenty of sunshine and then Lab City Late day is when we're going to see that snow and or rain move in. So here Saturday morning, we'll start to see that system edge in again for Labrador, mainly snow to start. And then we'll see that higher elevations as well for uh, parts of the island. There's the snow that I was talking about. Numerous models are showing accumulating snow somewhere between five to 10 centimeters. Again, still very early uh, as far as that goes. I'm hoping it continues to track a little bit further south and we get out of that snow, but doesn't look very likely at this moment. Uh, into Saturday afternoon or rather Sunday afternoon, things should clear out, change over to the potential for showers and then the rest of Sunday into Monday doesn't look all too bad. So if we take a look at uh, the next five days uh, for your forecast, snow to rain again tomorrow. So four degrees, five, six uh, as we head towards the weekend. And then Sunday uh, is when we've got that either rain or snow uh, or rather snow Saturday night into Sunday and then clearing for Monday and eight degrees. Now for central Newfoundland, it's essentially the same forecast. A little bit warmer though for Friday and Saturday than 12 degrees. Plenty of sunshine on Monday. Sunday also could see a few breaks uh, in the clouds as well. So it won't just be a full uh, gray day, but that's what we're looking at there for Western Newfoundland. Eight degrees tomorrow, 14 on Friday. Normally should be sitting around 11 degrees. And then for Saturday, we're looking at plenty of uh, rainfall. 10 and 12 degrees as we head towards the end of the week. So that's good there uh, up through eastern Labrador. Five degrees tomorrow, 11 on Friday with plenty of sunshine. We're going to stay above zero uh, as we head towards Monday as well with that sunshine. And then for Western Labrador, three degrees with uh, that potential for some flurries. Rain changing to snow on Friday. And then we're going to continue to stay unsettled through the day on Saturday and Sunday. So let's look at your forecast. We will have uh, a look at some drone footage when uh, I come back. Comedian Vicky Malali says, don't be dumb, embrace democracy. Newfoundlanders and Labradorians show up when it comes to voting for a singing or reality TV star. So surely you can do it again come election day, can't we? So with the provincial election ongoing, I got to thinking, what's gonna change and how? You see, the people in Newfoundland and Labrador deserve to have our concerns heard and addressed. Why? Because we're deadly. And how are we gonna make sure that happens? By making sure it's not a dumbocracy. Know what I mean? What's one way we can make sure it's not a dumbocracy? By making sure we get out and vote. Now, politics really isn't my strong suit. However, I was voted class treasurer in grade seven, so maybe I am an expert on elections. Either way, I know it's really important to get out and vote. Now, I myself have been guilty in the past of not paying attention and even staying home on election day. Now, I'm proud of a lot of things in my life. You know, like when I remember to throw the dish towels in with my laundry instead of realizing afterward. But I'm not proud of that. Who was it helping, really? I've since fixed it because I know it's my responsibility as a Newfoundlander to care what happens to our home. So my plan is to look at the candidates who are running or even when they're standing still, and see who I think is best kind. Which candidate's views align most with mine? That's who's gonna get my vote. To those running, what are you gonna do to ensure that people stay here, start families here? Speaking of families, 
How ironic is it that people pretty much have to give up their firstborn in order to afford childcare? What are you gonna do about that? If we can come together as a province and vote like we did for Sexy Rexy on Canadian Idol, I think we can find the time to get out and vote for the provincial election. Wait, is he running? Doesn't he sing about it in a song though? Baby just run? Well, he'd have my vote, I'll tell you that for free. So guys, the provincial election is coming up on May 16th, and a lot of us are looking for good improvements and change. Now how are we going to make sure that happens? By making sure it's not a dumb-ocracy. There you go. And speaking of Canadian pop icons, one is in St. John's today promoting his upcoming tour. Corey Hart will be performing at Mile One Centre later this month. It's the start of his Never Surrender tour, the first time he's toured since stepping out of the spotlight 20 years ago. Now, during the past two decades, he and his wife have been raising their four children, and Hart has been producing music for artists like Celine Dion. And I got a chance to sit down with Corey Hart this morning to share a feed of Towton's at Mallard Cottage. So Carolyn, let me ask you a couple questions here. Okay. So this one's just a little more toasty. Is, is uh -huh. that better to be more toasty? It or depends. Like, they on look your... like English muffins right now. They kind of do, but they're like dough that's just been fried. Right. So very yeah. nutritious. Good, good very cholesterol level. Your show is May 31st in St. John's, which is also your birthday. Yes, ma'am. Being in St. John's to start my tour was by design, something mm -hmm. that I that I asked the promoters is specified. I don't care how you route the rest of the tour, but I want to start in St. John's, Newfoundland, because that's where I started my 1985 Boy in the Box tour, which was the first time I ever headlined as a as a recording artist, as a, a touring artist. Why now? Well, I've got four kids. Mm -hmm. The oldest is 23, the youngest is 15. They know how much Daddy loves music, and they really encouraged me to do this. They really said, you know, you given us 20 years and um, it's time you know for you to go back and do something that you used to do in your other life wow. so it's just worked worked out beautifully for me yeah we had a great chat about his upcoming tour his music and his decision to include a rendition of the Ron Hines song Sonny's Dream on his newest album and surprise surprise he loved the Towtons uh, tune in for that full interview with Corey Hart this Friday on here and now
Well, we usually do a weather photo at this point in the show, but today I just had to show you this weather video. Drone footage taken not too far from St. John's Harbor on an iceberg tour. Thanks to Patrick Morell, a visiting CBC colleague from Toronto, for sharing. That is stunning. I hope I get to do that one day. Oh, I'm sure you will. <laughs> wow. Have to get you out to see some icebergs for sure. Super Definitely. view. Super. <laughs> Well, that's it for us. Good night, everyone. See you tomorrow.